All right, well, I'm really happy to see so many of you made it back from lunch. Uh, it's great to, great to have you here, and uh, it's wonderful to have Lydia Del Rio here talking about quantum thermodynamics, an area I'm really passionate about, and I'm sure we'll get to hear a lot more from her. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming here, all of you. It's so good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this tutorial. Since there are already a few talks about thermodynamics in at this conference, which I will announce at the end, this will be a very broad and, and um, in a way, a bit superficial um, tutorial, just to give you kind of an overview of the field for those of you who are computer scientists or mathematicians or uh, the kind of physicists that I was before starting to work on thermodynamics. Uh, so it's just to give you more of an idea of what quantum thermodynamics is and how we're approaching it. Okay. So let's just start with a small introduction. Why, why should we study quantum thermodynamics? Why is this interesting? So there are three different perspectives, in my opinion. So on one hand, you have the philosopher. So these are people like me who wonder, like, why is thermodynamics such an effective theory? Is it, is it luck? Is it just an emergent theory? Or can we, can we have some axiomatic formulations, some, some like information-driven approach to thermodynamics? Well, what is really the essence of this theory? Then we can have someone who is an explorer, who has studied thermodynamics of large systems. And I was interested in seeing what happens when they go and study quantum systems or very small systems. And you ask, well, do the same laws uh, apply to quantum systems, or do we need to make some corrections, and are these corrections because of the quantum part or just because we have very small systems and there are some finite size effects? Oh, and are there like some new quantum effects that we can explore and, and phrase in terms of thermodynamics? So can we expand this framework in this sense? Um, but all of these people, they still start from this idea of, you start from thermodynamics and now you want to explore it in new regimes. On the other hand, you, you can have the engineer, who is someone who is interested in actually developing a machine and making it efficient a, according to some parameters of, of relevant in this regime. And by the way, this, these are the kind of people who develop the first thermodynamics, uh, thermodynamic theory. So here, you might be interested in very, in very concrete questions like, oh, what's the heat dissipation in quantum computers? How can we keep this low? Or you know, how small can we make heat engines? And, you know, maybe work and heat are not the real, the valuable quantities to talk about, but we should be looking at different parameters and what should we be looking at. Okay, so in this talk, I hope that I will go over a bit of the three, of the three perspectives. So we'll have three parts. So in the first part, we'll talk mostly about the relation between information and thermodynamics, uh, work cost of, of erasure, the work value of information, etc. So we look first at the classical case to give you uh, some intuition, and then we look into the quantum case. And then, so this will give us a bit of small results and interesting phenomena, but not an overarching framework to treat them. And this is what we'll see in the second part of the talk, okay? Uh, so there we'll, we look at axiomatic approaches to quantum thermodynamics, in particular uh, resource theory approaches. We'll see what they can tell us. We'll see why this particular resource theory, are these principles justified? And then we'll talk about uh, directions and open questions. Yep. Okay, so you might think that a priori uh, thermodynamics didn't have anything to do with information, right? You're trying to move trains. What does it matter? Uh, what information you have about the system? And maybe the first example where this started to play, play a role was Maxwell's demon. <laughs> so, most of you are already familiar with this paradox. So imagine that you have a box and it's filled with some gas, okay? And here's some observer, Alice, and all she can see of the gas is that it has some pressure and volume, and it's all at the same temperature, okay? So she cannot do anything with this box. But then we have someone else who has access to more information. So this is a demon, and he has some microscope, and he can see all the particles in there. And you know, a gas at a certain temperature because it's, it's formed by particles that are traveling faster and slower, okay, with some distribution. And he's sitting here at this little door, 
and you can see which particles go fast and which go slow. So you can control this door, okay? This doesn't cost anything, it just opens the flap, and it lets all the slow ones come to the left and all the fast ones stay uh, on the right. And with this, what it creates is like a, a gradient in, in temperature in which he has like all this cold gas on the left and a hot gas on the right. And then later it can let the hot gas expand and extract some work from this. Okay. And for, for many years this was a puzzle of, you know, thermodynamics tells us that you cannot extract uh, any work from a single heat path. So how come that he can do this? And obviously the answer has to do with information. So let's see how to treat this piece by piece. Okay. No, let's not see how to treat this piece by piece. Let's first uh, think about the general question of, you know, this is a nice paradox, but what about concrete applications for us? So the idea is that thermodynamics studies is a kind of glorified accounting of heat flows and energy flows, which is relevant because you may have, you may want to perform a, a computation, but you're also interested in, not just in the logical circuit that you have, but also in how much power you have to supply to this computer or how much heat will be dissipated. Also because the heat that is dissipated might, uh, might cause you decoherence problems, okay? And these are the kind of questions that Funnily enough, also have to do with information, also have to do with thermodynamics, and will also be addressed in the following. Okay. So, uh, Szilard boxes are a very simple toy model uh, invented by Szilard. And here's the idea. You have one bit of information, which is encoded in the following. You have a, a, a box with a partition in the middle, and then you have a particle on one of the two sides. And around this box, you have... a a heat path, so some environment of some temperature that keeps the, the particle with some momentum. Okay. If you don't like the idea of a single particle heat path, then you could think that all the gas particles, there's many gas particles on the right, or they're all on the right, but they're all on the left. In either case, you have one bit of information. Okay. And the idea would be like, how can you extract work from this one bit of information? Well, if I know where the particle is, I can attach uh, like a little bucket with some mass, and then this is expanding, so it expands this volume. And if I integrate uh, how much it expands, it gives me actually a kt log 2 work. Okay, so this is the difference in, in um, the potential energy of this thing. Okay, so I now have a, a mass that is high up, and I can use this as stored work. Okay, so this is like the classical idea of, of what work is. Okay, and we can also go the other way around. So imagine that I have this box and I don't know if the particle is on the left or on the right, uh, but I want to reset this bit, okay? So I start with no information. What I can do is instead of putting this lever, uh, this divider here in the middle, I can put it on one of the sides and then just push it, okay? And pushing this uh, costs me again kt log two. K is the Boltzmann con constant. So it's just a constant to transfer to compare between temperatures and energy. Okay, so this is the, the, the heart of Landauer's principle, which tells you that, well, you can trade information and heat from a heat path for work, okay? So heat just means energy that we don't have very good control of, and like a heat path, and work just means energy that we know where it is. Okay, like here you have this weight that is lifted here, so this is really uh, no surprise. And what is interesting is this uh, rate, this conversion rate of kt log two per bit. And this, by the way, is the solution to Maxwell's Zeeman problem. So here's Maxwell's Zeeman. He already created this um, this difference in temperature between the two the two sides of the box. And now this, and now you think, oh, he's done. He just extracted work from nothing. But if you look at the bigger system where you also think about the memory of the demon, then this demon he had to store this information somewhere about each particle. And then either he will just you know, never erase this memory and then you have this side product which is uh, a new system filled with trash that is useless now. Okay, so it's not a, uh, a cyclic process. Or at some point you'll have to erase 
all of this data and actually the, the erasure of this data, so resetting this, this blackboard costs him exactly the same amount of work that he spent, that he gained in this whole process. Okay. And now back to our other questions about the cost of computations. So the solution also has to do with this trade-off between information and, uh, and work. So the idea uh, for Bennett is that every computation can be split into two parts. One would be a reversible part followed by erasure. So in the same way that when you have a quantum map, you can always dilate it to think of it as some unitary followed by a unitary on, on a system and the ancilla falling by tracing out this ancilla, okay, forgetting about this ancilla. And the idea is that let's pretend for now that the reversible computations are free in principle, okay? And then the work cost becomes just the cost of erasure of this extra ancilla. Because otherwise, you end up with all these memories in your computer that are full uh, with useless stuff. Okay? So what do I need, what do I mean by erasure? More explicitly, it would be like formatting a hard drive. So this means I had all these bits that I stored here, some are zeros, some are ones, some I don't remember anymore what they are, and I want to set them all to zero. Or in the case of a quantum system, I have some some system that could be in some state and I want to reset, reset it to a standard state. Yep. So just to give you some idea of the numbers of what uh, this limit gives you. So this constant k is very, very small, such that the erasure of a 16 terabyte hard drive at room temperature costs uh, 0 0.4 um, microjoules. And to have some idea of what this means, Lifting a tomato, a tomato by one meter on Earth costs one joule, okay? So these fundamental limits are still very, very far from what uh, the industry can do, but they will become relevant at some point and they're interesting on their own. So now you could think, okay, so this costs me kt log two per bit, but uh, what if I have some more information about the thing that I want to erase? So for example, you could have a fractal. A fractal is a very, looks like a very complex object, and if you didn't know that this was generated by a small program, you'd think, oh, wow, well, I need to erase all these bits, okay? But since there is a very small program that generates it, what you can do is compress, okay? Like in the same way that in coding theory, you can code something and then decode it. So here you compress it, and this is a reversible process because it can also go from there back. And now you have a much shorter program, uh, n bits, say, which you then can erase. So then in the end, this just costs you uh, n k2 log 2. Okay. And the idea of this is that in general, what we can do is uh, take any message, compress it, and on in the ideal limit, this would give you the entropy of the, of the original message, and then from this, you erase it. And this is where information comes into play. And another aspect of this is that, well, information is also subjective. So in the same way that maybe someone before who did not have information about this fractal would have a harder time erasing it, you could also think that, well, maybe I have a system and I prepare it here in this bit one, okay? And then I tell Alice, Alice, it's in, it's in state one. And I tell Bob, well, I don't tell them anything. Okay? And then I tell them, please erase this bit. Okay? So while Alice, if she knows that it's in state one, she can just apply a reversible operation like a NOT gate and erase it for free. Now Bob would have to apply uh, this erasure procedure, which then costs him KT log two. Which is to say that actually the work cost of erasure depends uh, on the entropy, and the entropy you have to take into account the memory of your agent. Uh, this is a general result in the classical case, okay? And now you may think, well, okay, how does this generalize for the quantum case? What needs to change? First of all, I showed you a very, I mean, a very almost microscopic sealed box 
And is there such an equivalent for, for quantum systems, or what does work even mean? Right? And then this idea of si using side information is very nice, but how, how do you use a quantum memory? You cannot just read it because it would disturb the contents of the memory. And finally, well, if you have quantum correlations and this conditional entropy can be negative, and does this mean anything? Or is it just, you know, just a quantity that is useful for information processing task but not, doesn't have a thermodynamic value or meaning? So I'm going to give you, um, this is a slow introduction to what we'll talk about later. So I'll give you first two models for like this quantum Sillard box. And the first one is a semi-classical model where the assumptions are that, well, we have a work storage system somewhere, but for now this is just implicit. And what we say is that, well, we have some systems and we can lift, you can change the Hamiltonian of the system. And to account for energy, what we say is, if you lift a level by delta E, this costs delta E, but only if the level is occupied. Okay, in the same sense that if I, if I lift a box, this only costs me energy if the box is full. <coughs> and vice versa. Uh, and reversibly, also I can lower the box, and it costs delta E if it's, uh, it gives me delta E if it's occupied. So here's how you extract work from one bit of information. So take a qubit, here are the two states, zero and one, originally degenerate. So now what you're gonna do is you, first you lift this level very high, and it costs you nothing according to this model. Okay, we'll discuss the, the assumptions behind the model later on. So you lift, you lift one, very high, the state is not occupied, you know this, so it doesn't cost you anything. And now you connect it to a heat bath, and the assumption here is that when you connect it to a heat bath and you wait long enough, this goes to a Gibbs state, to a thermal state. So it's just an exponential state, yes? And you start lowering this very, very, very slowly. So what happens? In the beginning, not much happens because this state is not occupied, but as you lower it, the probability of being occupied gets higher, right? So with some probability, you're getting delta E every time you do this. And if then you integrate um, how much you gained, by the time you get to the end, you gained exactly kt log two on average. Okay. And you end up with, uh, uh, with a maximally mixed qubit. Yes. So this would be one example of how could have a quantum Sillard box if you believe that these assumptions are justified. So here's another one, tries to be a bit more explicit and we'll come back to this framework later. So here you model, first of all, you model your battery, your battery system um, explicitly. So just like before you, you thought of this weight that you lift, now you can think that you have a harmonic oscillator, okay? And lifting the state of this harmonic oscillator corresponds to heat, okay? Because now we have a state in some, in some high energy state, um, with some high energy, which later, you know, you can just store it there like you store this weight, and then later on you can use this. That's the idea. And then for the heat bath, well, instead of being always thermalizing my system, I just give myself an explicit heat bath, which I say can be as big as it is, and it's already in, a, in this Gibbs state. Okay, which means that I can take, I can draw qubits from there, and you know, if the gap is very big, then this exponential will mean that there's almost no probability of being in an excited state, and if it's, as it becomes uh, smaller and smaller, the gap, then the probabilities become closer. Yes. And, then, and then I say, okay, so let's give myself these two things, and now the rules of the game is that I can apply unitaries, but only unitaries that conserve energy. So then I know that I'm not injecting any energy into the system and I'm not injecting or taking away any, any entropy. Yes, are these rules clear? Yes. Uh, if you have questions, I may not see your hands, so just say something. Okay, so using this, using this idea and starting again from a qubit that is on state zero, there is a protocol which which takes you to a maximally mixed qubit here, and, in the, and at the same time raises your, raises your, um, 
your work storage system, your battery, by KT log 2. On average, with fluctuations that decay with 1 over square root of, of n, where n is the number of steps that you take. Okay. So the idea here is, just like before in this, in this other semi-classical protocol, you have to do every step very slowly, yes, and let things thermalize, and move just a little bit, like go in this quasi-static um, quasi regime, where the idea is you're not throwing away too much energy at every given step to the bath. So here what you do is you take many, many, many of these qubits such that the probability distribution here matches almost exactly the probability distribution here, okay? And you apply uh, essentially a kind of a, a control swap where you swap, um, where this acts as your control qubit and you swap these two, yes? So what happens then is on the first step, with very low probability, it goes very high, and with most probability, nothing happens. In the second step, the probability of going up goes a bit, uh, is a bit higher, a bit higher, a bit higher, etc. Just like before, like when you start here and there's a big gap, very likely nothing happens, and as you go down, the probability that you gain energy increases. So the protocols are very similar, but the models are different. Yes. Okay, so. And vice versa, you can also go from a fully mixed state in your system and erase it to, a, to state zero, and this costs you an average KT log two. Okay, so this is what we're gonna take as a building block, like we took the Sillard boxes as a building block. Yep. And now, if you have this, then we can talk about erasure with quantum information. And then, as I said before, we cannot just go look at the memory, see what it says, and then do like uh, a control operation because we need, we don't want to disturb the memory too much. So for example, imagine that you have all these qubits in your, in your lab and you want to erase the first qubit but preserve the state of the others, yes? So for example here, your first qubit is your system that you want to erase and it's maximally entangled with the first qubit of your memory. And the other two are in some state. Okay. And what you want to do is to erase this first qubit, so take it to state zero, yes, and keep the rest as it was. So in this case, it goes to row two, three, doesn't change, and this also doesn't change, so it's now a maximum mixed state. Yes. And more general, more generally, we can have this memory preservation condition, which means, well, I want to erase S and I have access to some memory M. Okay. And my condition is that I don't want to destroy M and I also don't want to destroy any correlations that M might have with any other system, any other reference system. Yes. So I want to go to this state zero and S and preserve the rest. Good. But I can act on M. I just need to return it in the, in the same state. And the, the good result is that we can still use this memory optimally, like we could in the classical state. So again, the work cost of erasure uh, becomes the conditional entropy, which now can be negative. So what does this mean? Let's, let's look at this simple example and see how one could do it. Okay. Um, so we start with this stage, and the entropy of S given M is minus one, right? because you have here a pure state minus uh, the maximally, minus the entropy of half of it, which is a maximally mixed qubit, it, it gives you minus one. And we want to take it to this stage. So here's a protocol to do it. On the first step, we see, well, I have here a very nice entangled state. I'm just gonna use my building block, like this Hillard engine kind of protocol to extract work from it. So I can unitarily take it to zero, zero, and then I have two qubits in zero, and I take kt log two from each of them. This gives me two kt log two. And you can ask, is this okay? Yeah, it's okay because now here on the one, you have a maximum mixed state, which you already had before, so you did not disturb the memory, and you did not touch the rest of the memory either. And then on the second step, you just say, well, now I have a maximally mixed qubit here on the first, 
So I use again the building block, and this cost me kt log, log two, t raised. So in total, uh, the work cost was minus kt log two, which is precisely the entropy. Yes. So again, I did this trade-off between information and work. I had these quantum correlations before that I don't have anymore. Yes, but in exchange, I gained. Uh, against some energy. Okay. And then more generally, we can use uh, decoupling results and single shot protocols and, and get something like that looks out like this. So the idea is always, sorry, the idea is always the same. So look for some part of your memory that looks maximally mixed or compress it to look maximally mixed. Then erase that together with the system. You get work out of this, so extract, extract work from this in the system because it's maximally entangled with the system, and then just erase the system. Okay. So this was all about erasing a particular state. And now I can ask, well, maybe if, if I want to build a quantum computer, what I want to know is not so much how much it costs to, to treat a particular state, but how much it costs to implement a certain gate, so an operation. And that is very similar again. So the result there is that you, if you have a map that goes from x to x prime, you dilate it, and then in the end, the work costs, it's kind of the work, is, would be the work of erasing this ancilla that you want to discard at the end, right? So it's like your map goes unitarily to your final output system and an ancilla. This doesn't cost any work, but then you want to erase the ancilla, and what else do you have? Well, all I have here is, my, is this output state, okay? So I use this conditional entropy of the final state. Okay, and this has been generalized not only for the generate Hamiltonians, but for any Hamiltonians in Philip Feist's thesis. And in numbers, again, it's a bit pathetic, because then running a 20 petaflops computation costs you one watt. Okay. So again, we are very, very far from, the, from any relevant limit, which, which is good. It means that engineers still have a long way to go before we need to do more theory. Uh, <laughs> actually, I don't know if that's good. <laughs> Can you cut this part from the video? <laughs> uh, okay. So, Again, like these are all results in very specific settings, and later on I want to, to generalize this whole approach. But before this, uh, let's, let's just go back uh, almost a century. And something that I didn't know until a couple of years ago is that you know, von Neumann entropy is called entropy for a reason, uh, and for a thermodynamic reason. Okay, so the way he came up with this was thinking, well, I have this, I have a particle gas, and all my particles are in this quantum state, and I have n of them, okay? And I want to erase this. Okay, so meaning that I want to take them to being all in the same state, yes? And how can I come up with a protocol that does this? And what he did was thinking, well, okay, Let's apply here some semi-permeable permeable, um, uh, membranes, okay? That only let some of the particles pass. And I use this to, um, to separate them. But there is no change in volume for each of these particles, uh, for each of these uh, boxes. So this doesn't cost me any work, okay? So now I have here this, these three boxes, and I know I know which particle is in, in each of them, so for each of them I can, oh, oh no, not yet. Okay, later on I'll apply unitary, but before this I want to go back to my original volume, yes, of having just a small box. And the idea is that, uh, well, okay, so then the volume in, the number of particles in each box will be proportional to this pK. So then, so will the volume of the final box, and then it, it sees how much it costs him to, to 
compress each of these boxes. And that is n and the logarithm of the difference between the volumes, okay, which is precisely n pk log pk. And then I think, well, then let's do this for all of them. Let's divide by the number of particles, and it gives me the work cost of doing this operation, which is precisely uh, the von Neumann entropy. And then I can apply a unitary operation on each of them, on each of these particles to, to take it to the state that I wanted. Or you could have done it the other way around, right? You could have applied this, this operation here, and now I want to compress. Okay. How much time do I have now? Good. So, uh, so now let's try to get a bigger perspective. So let's think about why thermodynamics is so effective in the first place so that later we can find the right way to look at it. So thermodynamics is great because it doesn't care about the microscopic details of some theory. It doesn't care if your gas is made of quantum particles or classical ones, okay? And that's why it could survive this, uh, the advent of, of quantum mechanics. So what it does is it just identifies what are the easy operations for an agent to do, what are the hard operations, what are the resources that come for free, like the room temperature. And based on this, it tries to tell you how you can, how you can exploit like these conditions, these constraints that you have in order to build efficient things like steam engines, fridges. Or also it tries to find like what's the minimal cost of transforming one state into the other. And in that sense, it's a very operational approach and is what we call a resource theory. And we could say that this is the first resource theory in physics. Um, so if you haven't heard this term before, then you probably have heard of LOCC, and this is an example of a resource theory. I'll go into this very soon. So just to give you an overview or introduction to the idea, A resource theory is to treat some kind of physical situation, or, or doesn't need to be a physical situation, as a game. Okay, so the idea is you, you imagine that there's an agent in this game, and you're going to play from the point of view of the agent. Okay. So you say, well, here's my, state, uh, my space of resources. It could be anything. And here's some set of allowed operations that I can do. And this imposes some kind of order in the resources. So for example, I don't know. Uh, so this could be a weight standing here, and a bit lower down, down but to the left, and then at the very bottom, for example. Yes? And there's only some directions in which I can go. And so for, from this, I get a pre-order in my structure, okay? Oh, which gives me a structure. And then from here, I can ask, Lots of questions. So for example, maybe this is a very complicated structure and I can ask, is there a simple way to characterize it? Can I find, for example, a monotone here, something that always goes down? So for example, here it could be the height of the object. Okay, or in thermodynamics, we'll see that it gives us the free energies. And then you can also ask, well, what are necessary and sufficient conditions to go from one resource to the other? And what are very useful resources in this theory? What are useless resources? Okay, so for example, here this D resource is almost for free because you can always get to it. So for example, uh, in LOCC, LOCC, your set of allowed operations is something that is deemed easy, comparatively easy, let's say, which are, uh, in this case, local operations and classical communication. That's because you think that you have agents, they are far apart, they can do everything in their labs, but they cannot apply like global quantum theory. So it, it's always the set of operations that gives this um, meaning to your resource theory that justifies it. And then the monotones that you can get are things like squashed entanglement, entanglement of formation, entanglement of uh, distillation. You learn from here that separable states are always free because you can always, you can always prepare them, doesn't matter what the initial state is. And then you can even think of things like a currency, which are states that are very useful and scalable, like pairs of bell states. So, how would you apply this kind of thinking to thermodynamics? Here we go. So 
First of all, let's think about what are our limitations. And let's think about the classical case. So one could be lack of knowledge about my, the exact state of my system. Right? When people are describing systems in terms of volume or temperature, they didn't think that this is the fundamental theory, but it's just the accessible information to them. Yes? So you can represent your states like this. Then you're, you are restrained by conservation laws like energy conservation, momentum conservation, etc. Also limited control of operations. You, you know, might not have absolute time control, but just let some, some gas expand, kind of things. Uh, so then, if you think of this, then what are your resources? There's this macroscopic descriptions of systems, and their operations could be, depending on the setting, they could be adiabatic operations or isothermal operations, meaning that you have access to some, to some environment temperature, for example. And then what insights can you get from this kind of, of framework? Well, actually, just from treating it as a resource theory like this, you can derive all the laws of thermodynamics. You derive the free energy as a monotone. You derive the Carnot efficiency uh, as a limit to the efficiency of heat engines, etc. And there is great work uh, on this by Cara Theodori and, and Giles, and then later by Lieben Ingvanson, in which they, they just say, well, let's have a theory. And let's say that there's something called equilibrium states, which are scalable, which have this nice order. Like in, like in LOCC, you have bell pairs that, you know, you can always go from four bell pairs to three, so they're, they're ordered. And then just using, just using this a little more, then you can derive things like, like the free energy or the entropies as the only monotones that scale nicely. And so how would you translate this to the, to the quantum case? Well, let's think of resources now as descriptions of quantum systems and quantum descriptions of quantum systems. So this meaning I can describe a system by some state and the Hamiltonian of the system, okay, because these are the things that we care about at the moment. And then what are the allowed operations? It's like in this model that we saw before. So we want to account for entropy, so we only allow for unitaries. We don't let anything give or take ener entropy, but also we want to account for en all the energy flows. So you say that all the unitaries that are free are the ones that commute with the Hamiltonian, so the ones that don't bring in any energy. And then, and then you can start from this, from this basic framework and then add more things or play with it. So one thing that is very common is to then say, well, let's add a free environment. Let's add some states that are free and that you can always get so for example, we imagine that you're, you're doing this experiment in some room at some temperature, so you can always let things thermalize at a certain temperature. Yes, so it is this. And then of course you can always trace out systems, you can always forget. Uh, yes, of course that this is a, a toy model, right? This is, if there's ever been a spherical cow, uh, thermal operations is it? And later on, we'll talk a little bit more about how to try to make this more realistic. So before I go into what results you can draw from here, let's try to question a little bit more, like why should we allow for this environment for free? Like why, why do you model a heat bath as a, as a thermal state? Okay. And we do this not only in, in when you treat thermodynamics like this, but also for example, when you're modeling some quantum memory and you want to have a, mo a noise model, this is useful, mo um, often model as a thermal noise, which is modeled in term by a, a Gibbs state. So why, why this? And is this justified? So let's go by parts. I'll give you three justifications to it. So the first one, is that it's a reduced description of a subsystem if you take the state of maximum entropy in the bigger system. So what I mean by this is, suppose that you have a large system composed of many independent parts, yes? And then you know something about the system. For example, you know the total energy, yeah? And you know that under thermal operations, you're never gonna change this energy, so you're always inside this shell, okay? And then assume that this is all you know about the system, is the energy, you know nothing else. And you model this because you, because you like probabilities. Uh, 
you model this as a maximally mixed state on this on his energy shell. Okay, <coughs> then it's no surprise that if you look at a very small system, yes, then it will look like this exponential. It looks like a Gibbs state. So this is kind of um, James' principal idea. So if you take a very large system and you have maximum ignorance and you model this via you know, all, all states are equally likely, then you get a, a reduced description of, of this type. Okay. So this is one way of saying, well, we model it like a Gibbs state because we know nothing about this path. Uh, the other justification is that it's a very typical state, actually. And this is, it's not surprising if you're familiar with decoupling results, for example. So the idea here is, well, if you have a big system and your small subsystem is much smaller, then for most global states and most subsystems, it will look as if it's in a, if it's, it's in a, a Gibbs state. Yeah? And, um, okay. So the thing is, you don't believe that the big system is actually in a, in a maximally mixed state, it could be in any state, but if you apply some random evolution or if you choose your subsystem randomly or if you, sub, if you choose it according to some constraints, then you very likely get a Gibbs state here. And one thing that is important is that uh, this is also true if your subsystem is not a local thing, but it corresponds to just some degrees of freedom that you, you have access to. Yes, so the idea is that most observables will appear to thermalize under this. Uh, under any evolution, yes? So here's the picture. You have a big thing, you have a big system, you look at only a small subsystem. And even if you have some side information about the whole thing, if you just choose this subsystem randomly or apply a random unitary, then it will appear to thermalize. There's also um, dynamic thermalization results, which tell you that, well, if your Hamiltonian is rich enough, which means that there are small perturbations. And for most times t and for most initial states, then it will appear to thermalize. Okay? This for most time t, the results on, time scale, on ta exact time scales vary a lot. And uh, I recommend this very nice review by Gogolin and Isaac, where they talk about very different types of thermalizations and their different constraints, and also for concrete systems. Okay. So the last, um, the last justification is this idea of passivity of the thermal state. So here the idea would be, well, let's say we don't give the thermal state for free. We just give this unitary operations. So then what is the, the only state that you, you could always give that does not trivialize the resource theory, which means Suppose I just uh, allow for unitaries and I allow you many copies of a state. Yes. What is the only state that you could not use to, by applying a unitary, reduce the energy of the state and raise some weight? Yes. And the idea is that, well, if you have only one copy of the state, then any state that has probabilities decreasing on the eigenvalues will do. Yes. But if you have, if you have many copies of the state, then only this exponential distribution will do. Yes? Now, despite all this nice argument, we know that the Gibbs state is still a spherical cow. Yes? It's still like... For example, in all of these cases, say, we know that the, we know that the state of the system is approximately the Gibbs state. Okay, but it doesn't mean that it is the Gibbs state. But we model it like the Gibbs state because it doesn't hurt, because it doesn't give you anything uh, for free. But what would be more interesting is, 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 to, is to have a resource theory where you can model the heat path as something that you have less information about than being in a Gibbs state. And we'll go into this a bit later on. So I think maybe I stop the first part here because then in the second part we can go into results. 
So it's a, are there questions at this stage? Great, yeah, if there's any questions, please. Yeah. Hi, I have a question about the claim you made that if we choose sort of a random evolution on a large subsystem, then we expect small subsystems of it to look like uh, thermal states. Is, am I stating that correctly? Yes, uh, that preserves energy. I see. I'm just a little bit confused because I've also sort of learned to think of the fact that if I pick a, a sort of random evolution with some disorder in it, then I should expect to get like Anderson localization, um, which prevents thermalization. So how should I make sense of huh. those two facts? So they are looking at very concrete. So when you say your evolution is random, well, how random is it, really? So for, uh, so for Anderson localization, it's just randomly drawn with diagonal disorder distributed in a certain way, but perhaps that's not random enough because it's not really, there's already quite a restricted class of evolution. This would be my guess, but okay. I'm not 100% sure that this is the reason, but it should be my guess, yes. It's like, you know, all this, all these results on, on, on thermal. I mean, it's very easy to, to have results on typicality of thermalization when you just say a Hilbert space, a random thing. And, and when you try to go to more concrete measures, for example, I try to replace the hard measure with something more, more physical, then, then it becomes more complicated. So for example, for there, are, there are these results in this, um, If you have random local, random but local interactions, that you still get thermalization. But anything, as you impose more constraints, it becomes more and more difficult to, to get this. And then you need to go and study. This is what math mathematical physicists do. Then go and study concrete systems and see what happens. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. You said, uh, okay. you said we are using the protocol of uh, unitary operators commuting with the global Hamiltonian to do operations that do not inject energy in the system. Yes. But of course, if you want to actually implement one of these operations on a physical system, you cannot do this immediately, but uh, you yes. will have to change temporarily the Hamiltonian and uh, wait that the unitary has been applied and then we put back the Hamiltonian to what yes. was at the beginning. Yes, yes, exactly. But why, when you change the Hamiltonian, you actually have to inject energy in the system. Yes, And I then you will need something else to store yes. this energy, then yes. this energy that will be put back at the end. Yes, but perfect. I mean, this is the point I was going to make in the second part, yes. Okay. But <laughs> okay. go on, yes. So the point, the, the question was that, uh, can yes. you have a framework in where you can account exactly for all these other machinery that we have to have in order to apply this? Yes. Unitary mm -hmm. operator commuting with energy. We will look into this in the second part. I mean, it's the idea of like, this is a spherical cow, right? And this already imposes some restrictions, but then later on we want to impose more restrictions to make it more physical. So for example, n do not allow for this arbitrary control because as you say, uh, y you need to be controlling like when you turn on and off a Hamiltonian and of course that this costs something. Uh, and we'll go into this later on, yes. All right, any further questions? All right, I guess the audience has voted themselves a longer coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>